Um, if I was going to sing a song this morning, though, which I'm not going to attempt, but if I was going to sing a song, it may well be that classic slim, dusty, uh, looking forward, looking back. Yeah. Only I think, um, and I'm not, qu- I'm not quite prepared to look at Zechariah and call him the slim, dusty of the Old Testament. Not quite prepared to go that far, but there is certainly an element we see in Zechariah as we come up to this period of Christ's return. We come up to the end of the Old Testament, the end of the prophets, the end of God's revelation at that time, and Zechariah seems to cast his eye back over all the stories that have come so far, all the prophetic words, all of the the visions and all of the expectation that the Jewish people have been looking forward to, and he casts his eye back. And he looks back and looks forward. So he does a little bit of a swap of um, Slim Dusty's lyrics there. So in saying that, this morning, I'd just like to see a show of hands just to get a bit of, bit of action happening. Who, who knows what I'm talking about when I refer to the colour bond man? Who comes to mind when, when you think of the colour bond man? I'll give you a hint. He's in his undies. Does that strike any bells? Has anyone seen that ad on TV? It's a while ago and the man goes out to pick up his newspaper off the front lawn and he turns around and he's just captivated by the beauty of his colour bond roof. Has anyone seen that or am I... Thank you, people watch TV, very good. I thought I was amongst um, some people that didn't watch TV. But, But there is that sense if you, if, you, if, you, if you have any sort of, if you can identify with that man at all, there is a sense if you felt the satisfaction of completing something, maybe a um, piece of, I don't know, I'm just going to look for examples outside my experience, maybe a piece of pottery that you've worked on for hours and hours and you've just, you look at it and you hold it up and you're so pleased and satisfied and, and that feeling of joy and contentment that lasts while you hold that that mug or whatever people make out of pottery. Or perhaps it's um, something that, that you've constructed. For me, it was, I guess, my fence. I, I looked at my fence and I, when, when I finished something, there's just that feeling. Do you know what I'm talking about? That feeling of satisfaction when you've finished something and it's all nice and straight and it's in line. and It's, it's just there's something that echoes in us of, 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 I don't know, of joy and of completion and of, of satisfaction. But... I've got to say that feeling never lasts. It's not too long when the, the fence doesn't quite look as straight as it once did. It's not too long before the colour bond iron loses its luster. And I guarantee that the colour bond man in his undies a week from then is driving in and out of his garage without a second thought. There's, there's a sense in which all those things that we can labour in and work and achieve and it has some sort of echo of something good of some sort of sense of worth and completion, but it's so short-lived, isn't there? And there's a sense in which um, I, I think when we look at these things, you start to, um, to realise, and I'd just like to read from 1 Corinthians, that, that there is a type of labour that doesn't end with that feeling of deflation and of, oh, here we go again, of rust and splinters. And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, puts it like this. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So how does this relate to Zechariah? Well, the labor that they have gone and started to get into, the building of the temple, the joy that was there in the beginning. We start to see some of these um, things and, and relating these things to Zechariah. Now, we'll talk about that a bit later, but you may not know these, a couple of things about Zechariah to start with. You may not know that it is, it is the most quoted book in the Gospels after the Psalms when it comes to Jesus' death, especially around the time of Jesus' death. Zechariah is heaven, heavily mined by the New Testament prophets as they see in Zechariah, the truth of what God is doing through Jesus on the cross. There's maybe, by some counts, up to 54 passages of Zechariah which are echoed throughout the New Testament, most of them in the book of Revelation. And there's this theme throughout the book of Zechariah of this remember God, return to God, 
in God your labor is not in vain. Put aside that work that just loses its satisfaction and in God and in his work that he has prepared for you to do, we can find that true joy and true satisfaction that echoes in those other things. So we're just going to quickly look at the context very quickly, um, where we're at. It's um, closely connected to Haggai, so if you, if you were here last week and heard Sam talking, then you'll also be able to see some of the, the ways in which this uh, overlaps and um, the timeline is very similar. So we've got the people of Judah. You remember them? They've returned to the promised land. A portion of them have returned to the promised land. And we're talking about that time after the exile. They'd been in Babylon. And initially, I don't know if you remember, but it was King Cyrus. And he'd allowed the people to go back and begin rebuilding the temple. And he was spurred on by those, um, those, those men, Nehemiah and Ezra, who we've read about. And, you know, initially in this, in this labor, there was heaps of enthusiasm. There was great, you know, there was great enthusiasm about this project, this rebuilding the temple. There was great expectations. But now some years have gone by. And they, they've been hard years. They're not easy years. The Persians are still in control. The taxes are high. The crops are failing. Life is hard. And the temple? The temple remains unfinished. And the bits that they have finished are honestly they're looking pretty ordinary. Nothing like that glory of the Solomon temple. So the people's enthusiasm and their hope, the initial hope that was there seems to be draining away as the hardships of life and the feeling of unmet expectations begin to rise. You can see how the cares and the concerns of the world, the world that they lived in, meant that they'd neglected the temple. They'd neglected their initial mission. And the, the foundation had been laid of the temple, but the building process had stalled. I know that feeling. Do you? Not because I've built a home and had a foundation that stalled, although I'm sure that's the experience of some people out there. But I know that feeling, and, and you may know it better than me, how you can start with such enthusiasm and hope, passion, zeal, only to be perhaps hit in the face with something unexpected. Maybe it was a job that felt so important, and now it feels just like drudgery, something maybe that once filled you with, with zeal and passion and purpose, but it now feels undoable because you are seeing so clearly at every level your deficiency, your inadequacy. Well, Zechariah described his time as feeling like a day of small things. You know, and sometimes I think our lives can feel so small and so insignificant and we can feel so ineffective. You know, life is hard. We're not seeing the results. We may slip back into sin. We may start to neglect the things of God. Our former passion and enthusiasm for building his kingdom wanes. And we find if we stop and reflect honestly on our lives that most of our time and energy is spent worrying about the prickles in our own backyard instead of the kingdom of God. Our time is consumed, consumed by our concerns, not God's concerns. You know, and just reflecting on that can really discourage us. And it can rob us of our passion. It can stop us from trying. It stops us from going. It stops us from doing. And we just sort of settle into a weary sort of rhythm, despondent, dejected, whilst maybe maintaining some sort of religious veneer. Are you excited? Does it sound like anything you've experienced? Because I think the people of Zechariah's day were feeling a bit like this. Because they had this expectation from prophets previously. They had promises of hope. They had promises of blessing. They had promises of restoration, of abundance. Yet what they faced seemed so far removed from those promises. Those promises. 
And under the circumstances they were living in, it was easy for the people to conclude that theirs was a time of insignificance. So into this steps Zechariah and Haggai also, who we heard about last week. And these two prophets, they come in with God's word. They come in with God's word and they lift and they encourage and they challenge. And they say, yes. They say those earlier prophetic works, those earlier prophetic words, they do stand. That blessing, that restoration, that abundance, that's still what God has intended for his people. But you need to get back to him. You need to return, return, return to him. You see it again and again in Zechariah. Return to the work that he's got you to do. Zechariah 1 verse 3 says, Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Zechariah encourages the people, as we, myself included, need to be encouraged this morning. Return to the Lord. Remember again the Lord. Remember afresh the promises that God has made to his people. Remember afresh that God will not turn away from you if you turn to him. Remember me and I will remember you, says God. Wait on God and pray, Zechariah says. God will send his Messiah, his Savior. God will bring his kingdom in. And Zechariah's hope is centered on God's commitment to his people. A commitment that would ultimately result in the removal of all their sin when the promised king in the line of David arrives. You see, Zechariah's hope is not in the strength of his own passion or the power of his own commitment, or his own adequacy. No, Zechariah's hope is in the power and passion and love of God's commitment to his people. Zechariah is confident. He's confident not in the power of his own hands, but in the power of the Spirit of God at work in and through God's people, in those big and in those little things. So... If there's anyone here this morning in need of encouragement, if there's anyone here in need of a second chance, anyone here for whom life at the moment is just hard, anyone here who is battling discouragement as they wrestle with that feeling of insignificance, well, brothers and sisters, if that's you, you're not alone. And I pray that God, through his word this morning, would encourage that he'd strengthen and he'd challenge us this morning and that our eyes too would look with Zechariah towards that Messiah. Are you excited? Yeah, me too. Zechariah's really almost very clearly broken up into three three sections. You can pretty well break it up into chapters 1 to 6, which talk about um, visions that Zechariah has, which are then interpreted to him by an angel. That section concludes with um, Zechariah being called out. He acts out this prophetic sign where he takes some silver and gold from the exiles and he makes a crown for the high priest of the time, whose name was Joshua. And in the end of this section, Zechariah symbolically crowns Joshua, the priest, as um, as king. And in this, there's the thread the hope of the coming branch, the coming Messiah. And then that concludes the vision section. We could call it vision if you're taking notes maybe. Then you have these other, you have chapters 7 and 8, and they almost act as like this transition between the last section, the vision section, and into the last section of the book. And in this transition section, it's a bit easier to understand, I think, than the vision section because it's, it's sort of written as a story, as a narrative, and it tells of this delegation coming to the temple uh, when it's almost, well, when it's being rebuilt and they're asking the question to the priests and the prophets, they're asking, do we need to continue to fast? Do we need to continue to go without food in, in an act of mourning? And, in, uh, and, and you see there are um, these people who are part of the returned exiles who lived outside of Jerusalem and it seems that 
ever since the destruction of Jerusalem, there's been this setup where fasting and lamenting have been put in place so that the Lord might return to his people with favor, that God might hear their confession of sin and bring forgiveness. And in this transition narrative, it's almost like the people are asking that come, they are asking, do we need to continue fasting? The temple is being rebuilt and, and God is about to return. Do we, do we need to continue fasting? And we hear in that section Zechariah's response to that, which we'll look at soon. And then the last section is made up of two oracles, which is um, chapters 9 to 11, the first oracle, and then chapters 12 to 14. And they call them, they call them oracles, but the best sort of understanding that I can give to that word was that it's like looking back on earlier prophecies uh, that God had given to his people and looking back to them and saying that those prophecies stand. It's looking back at God's word and saying God is going to keep his word. He's going to bring it to pass. So I've sort of tagged that section of the book, Confirmation, because what God says is what God will do. So you have these three distinct sections, vision, transition, and confirmation, and we'll sort of shake on each section briefly this morning and sort of see what fruit falls down for us that we can feast on. So first, the vision section, right? Visions are sort of notoriously a bit hard to sort of work out what's going on, but they're sort of beautiful and wonderful in a way too because it sort of sucks you into this this wild world where you're sort of looking and you're, you're inquiring, and I think that's sort of part of the intention of them, sort of drawn into the language and all these these strange things that are happening. But as And as you read that section, <clears throat> I think the thing that just jumps out of the page is that you get a very clear sense of a God who is not surprised by anything that is going on, a God who has a plan that he's working to complete, and he's using many different means, and he's using many different ways, and you just see this reality that God is in control, and at the right time, God will act. You see, nothing is happening outside of God's control and plan. You see that God is not passive, that he is actively involved, bringing to pass all that he has a mind to do. It is God who has determined the movement of nations and the extent and the power that they would have. And if we read, if we just take up our Bibles and read in Zechariah chapter 1, just as an example of this confidence that God exudes, um, chapter 1 verse 14 to 17. It says, So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts. My cities shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. You know, that's the sort of confidence that only God can have as he declares what shall be. And when God says it will be, then it will be. Again, we turn the page and see in Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, he says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So you can see just, just from that and, and, and in the rest of the visions, God declaring, this is what's going to happen. I will do this. I shall do this. This is happening. I'm raising up these people to do this work. I'm doing this. And we could look and examine it. It's really interesting, but we're just going to zero in a little bit to make a point on verses Chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. So chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, and it's a part of this vision that uh, 
Zechariah is having, and he says, And I lifted my eyes and saw, behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? And he said to me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, and I said, What are these coming to do? He said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, so that no one raised his head. And these, these craftsmen, have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah, to scatter it. Pretty interesting. It's not the only place in the Bible when some of these symbols are mentioned. These these horns are a pretty popular vision um, sort of picture, and they often resemble military might and power. And so there's lot, I get lot, lots of speculation about what particular nations they might be, and we don't need to go there for the point this morning. But these four horns that have brought down and scattered, that God has used to scatter Israel and Judah and Jerusalem, these mighty military forces, are brought down by who? Who are they brought down by? Four craftsmen. Now, there's a bit of speculation about these craftsmen, and some, some versions might say something like a blacksmith, you know, you know, and, and the word is used like that in, in the Bible, certainly. But more often, this word for craftsman is used, I think most commonly, it's actually used in connection with the temple, with the artisans, with the people that were carving, the people that were uh, shaping the jewels, and the people that were building the little structures. It's not necessarily a figure of power. They're significant. They're a part of it, but they're not necessarily a figure of power, and you see these great horns being brought down by these craftsmen. So I think this is, again, knowing what's going to happen in Zechariah and knowing how God likes to work in using the weak, I think this idea of craftsmen bringing down those great mighty horns in Zechariah just might be, again, another example of this same idea. We read last week, and Sam read it last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. We read, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised, perhaps you could say insignificant, in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that, for what purpose? So that no human might boast in the presence of God. And I think this idea of these craftsmen bringing down these horns in Zechariah, I think this is another example of this same idea, that God is choosing those, the weak to carry out his mission, to build his kingdom so that the world would know for sure who is ultimately responsible. You see, God isn't using brute force to bring in his kingdom these days. He's using the weak and the powerless, which then ties into, if you read Zechariah in chapter 4, verse 6, and you'll know this verse when I read it, and it just resounds with everything. It's almost like a summary of how God works in the world. He says, not by might, nor by power, But by my spirit, says the Lord, all glory to God, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I'm going to use the weak, the worthless, the insignificant, those without, the potters, the bakers, the candlestick makers. I'm going to use these people to bring about my kingdom so that the world might know that it was by my power, says God. And it reminds me again of these... these, um, these connections we have in the New Testament, the confidence that God just exudes when he says, um, when our Lord says in Matthew, he says, I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. There's nothing that can stand against God completing the work that he has set out to do. That's pretty exciting and we can be a part of that, but we're not to be a part of it thinking that we did it, right? 
God did it. And you see the same sort of truth echoed, and, and I, I feel like it's um, just a part of you know, Paul the Apostle's ministry when he says, I toil. I think in Colossians he says, I toil and I'm struggling. I work hard with all his energy that he powerfully supplies and works within me, right? It's like we work hard knowing that all the power and all the glory and all the results are his. So I found that encouraging again to see these layers of truth written into these, uh, these visions. And so then after this, this vision section, we could call it the transition, or if you like another shun word, you could call it the delegation. I don't know why I do that when I, when I write this stuff down. It just seems to... I'm, I made up a word called oracleization, but it's not a word, so I just I ditched that. And delegation is a word, transition is a word, and that's, that's this section of this book in chapters 7 and 8. And this is really... This is really awesome. If you've got your Bibles, open it up there because we'll, um, we'll read a bit and God will talk to us through this, I think. So it, as mentioned earlier, we have, um, we have this delegation. They're living in the outskirts, not in Jerusalem. They're coming into Jerusalem uh, from these settlements and they come and they've been fasting and they've been lamenting for 70 years, it seems, uh, sort of on this, they had this schedule, this, you can read about it, like month and this month, and I can't pronounce the months, but they had this schedule of fasting and lamenting since that time of destruction uh, of Jerusalem. And that was all an attempt, uh, they had the aim of a, of a demonstration of repentance in seeking God's favour. And you see now these people, they see that the temple is being rebuilt. And they come in and they come to ask the priests and the prophets in Jerusalem if they do we, do we need to continue to fast? Um, do we need to continue this ritual? And you know, Zechariah's answer, I just found, I just found it really interesting because he says in chapter 7, verses 6, uh, verse 4 to 6. So chapter 7, verse 4 to 6. So this delegation has come. They're waiting on the answer. Do we need to continue our fast? Do we need to continue this ritual that we're doing? And Zechariah answers, and he just doesn't answer these, this particular delegation. He uses their question, and he expands it, and he talks to everybody in Jerusalem, outside all. He talks to them all, and he says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. And he said, Say to all the people of the land and the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? You see, the Lord, through Zechariah, turns the question back, back onto the people. He moves the question's focus away from this ritual and he moves it into the area of relationship. God asks them, he said, when you did all that fasting, when you were going through that process, your fasting and mourning, when you were were doing all that religious stuff and that ritual, were you doing it for me? Or were you doing it for you? God asks, are you going through your religious actions in order to get me, to just for me, or are you doing it in order to get my stuff? You see, the thing is, it's not just about rebuilding this temple building. It's not just about carrying out this fast, this religious ritual. It's about living out your relationship with the Lord. And that isn't just a box that you tick every fifth month and seventh month. It's the evidence of a life that you live. And you know, Zechariah gives us some context here. He gives us some example of what a, a evidence of a life that has been changed and affected by God. He gives us evidence of what that will look like. Because it's got a context. It's got, it's got a tangible aspect to it, this relationship that we have with God. And we read, uh, I think it just starts again in verse 8. 
And the word of the Lord came, this is just after that bit. And the word of the Lord, this is his challenge. He's reaching for the hearts of these people who are, who are, who are asking about ritual, which is okay, fast, and, but he, now he's zeroing in, he's turning it back. Where's your heart? For what purpose and what intention were you doing these things? What intention do you get up in the morning and pray? For what reason do you read your Bible? And he's after that. So verse 8 of chapter 7 says, The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. So this is the sort of thing that a life lived for God will look like. Godly people care deeply about the things of God, and that will be evident in their heart for others, especially the oppressed and the poor. So don't be fooled. I think when we look at these verses and we see this, these, these, aren't, these things that Zechariah mentions is here, looking after the fatherless and the widow, the sojourner, etc. These aren't just more items to add to your religious checklist. It's like you render true judgments, check. Didn't oppress any widows, check. No, that's not, that's not the point. These are not things that you carry out in order to try and like twist God's arm that he might that he might look on you with kindness, although that's definitely how some people operate. They turn it into this religious opportunity to try and peg another little mark for themselves in the ladder, climb their way to God. But the heart of that attitude is not God. It's not others. It is you. Sort of like that man who, you know, you see those things on Facebook or whatever, he films himself. You know, they often film themselves giving like $50 or $1,000 to a homeless person and It's like they're filming it in order to get what? For themselves, right? They want the likes and the approval. They want other people to tell them how good they are and how generous they are and how kind they are. Doing stuff in order to get stuff from God. That's not what we're talking about. No. These sort of examples, these tangible examples, these are things that God's people will do, not in order that they may get something from God, but it will be an overflow It will overflow out of their lives because God has faithfully committed himself to them. It starts with God. It starts with God's recognition that God has faithfully committed himself to you. And from that, we overflow in generosity and these things, especially to those needy and the oppressed. So we see, we see an example of this sort of commitment in that section. We see an example in chapter 8. If you read, I'll just read it out in um, verses 4 to 8. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is an example of this, this promise and this commitment that God has to his people. I, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvellous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvellous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country, from the west country, and I'll bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and righteousness. So this was the future that they were promised, and it certainly must have seemed like a far cry from where their people were at the time, you know, because they were were in that hard time, taxes and crops failing, and yet God has this promise of this time when they're going to grow to a ripe old age, they're going to be enjoying, they're going to be hanging out in the park. There's not this pressure of work, 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 they're able to enjoy and relax. But it must have seemed such a far way from where they found themselves. But God calls them. He calls them to look not to what they see, but to trust his promises and commitments to them. God's word will stand. 
Just as he had promised to bring disaster against their forefathers, he had done it. He had done so. Now God has prom- promised and purposed to bring good to Jerusalem and the house of Judah, and he will do so. Well, that's, that's all well and good. That God has planned such blessings for his people. But there is one monumental problem, I think, one glaring question, one impassable objection that remains for those who long to be right with God. There is a question that gnaws on the person who's thinking about these things. Exactly how do those, exactly how do those who have sinned against a holy God become right with God? We talk of this time of promise of blessing and commitment and dwelling in the kingdom, but how can a people who have sinned against the holy God become right with God? How can can it happen? How can a sinner receive mercy and yet God remain just? The question is, how does anyone get to enter into a loving relationship with the holy God? Because we know already from Isaiah that we all like sheep have gone astray. We all have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the reality is for this people and the reality for us today is that without sin being dealt with, there is no hope for a peaceful eternity in God's kingdom. There remains only a sure expectation of the judgment of God against our own wickedness. And that must have been, surely, that must have been the burning question in the people of Zechariah's day. And it should again be the burning question for us. Amazingly, we will see that the hope for salvation then and now is the same as we move into the last section of the book, those confirmation, the oracles. As Zechariah reiterates the truth that reverberates throughout all the Old Testament, right from Genesis, the plan that God has had since the foundation of the world for the salvation of his people. And it centers on a king the Messiah, the anointed one. Everyone's hope for salvation, for entrance into God's kingdom rests on this king. And Zechariah, almost more than any of the other prophets, just sees that. And it's like God might be filling in all the blanks as we get up to nearing to the time of Christ, filling in all the little bits so we could be so clear and so certain about what he is talking about, what is expected of this Messiah, this coming one, the anointed one, the one who's going to bring about the kingdom. Because Zechariah's hope all rests on this king. All of God's promises to forgive, to bless, to restore, to prosper, rest on this king. Do you know this king? Let's read Zechariah 9 verse 9 and see if we can work this out. You will understand this. You will know this. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you know this king who is salvation? He is salvation. You know this king. His name is Jesus. And 500 years, Odd years after Zechariah wrote about him, he entered Jerusalem exactly as it was said he would. And those people at that time when Jesus rode in on the colt, on the donkey, those people at the time yelled out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Saviour, Saviour. But on that day, those people didn't understand how he would save them. They thought they needed a Saviour from the Romans. But they needed a saviour from themselves, from their sin. And not too long after that, when Jesus was nailed to that cross, those same people went away dismayed because they didn't understand why their saviour needed to die. But if they'd understood and read Zechariah 12, verse 10, where God declares that he will, Pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy 
so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. God is going to pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that way they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. On him whom they have pierced. Just a careful consideration of that passage. If you've got a highlighter, if you want to go back and meditate on any one verse today, feel free to do that with any of them. But that one astounds me. It amazes me. God is talking of himself. He's talking of himself. When when they look on me, and then all of a sudden he's talking about on him whom they have pierced. It's like, that would have been a shock to any reader who read that. Is God saying that he is going to be pierced? How is it that God would talk of him as if he was somehow next to yet the same? How is it that God being pierced there And then chapter 13, you read that a fountain that opens up that will cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Well, you go on through chapter 13, and you can see why this is so clearly just seen by the New Testament authors to talk about the death of Christ. You read in chapter 13 about the good shepherd, God's chosen leader, and it's another reference to this Messiah. In chapter 13, verse 7, where God declares, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against, hang on, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. And you see here that judgment is falling. Judgment Payment of sin is falling, but it's not falling on the sheep. It's not falling on God's sheep. It's falling on God's shepherd. God, with his own sword, strikes his shepherd, the one that stands next to him. No, you see, God is just, and his just condemnation and his judgment for sin has fallen on the man who stands next to me next to him. This man who stands next to him is Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the coming king who is one with God, who was with God before the ages, before the ages began. The only son of God who descended from heaven and clothed himself with flesh, who found who humbled himself to be born into this world. Jesus who on the cross as he died satisfied the justice of God against sin so that all sinners who by faith put their trust in Christ might enter into God's family and into God's kingdom for all of eternity. This is the hope. This is the hope of Zechariah's day. This is the hope of our day. Forgiveness of sin, that great obstacle, but forgiveness of sin wrought purely by the hand of God. Nothing, nothing in our hand, no works of our own. It's all of Christ, nothing of ourselves, not our work, not our ritual, not our religion. Our hope for salvation rests solely in Christ, our King. Well, how do we wrap this up just quickly? Zechariah, I think, reminds us of the promises of God, that God is a God who keeps his word and that what he says will happen, will happen. God is establishing his kingdom He sent Jesus, he did that, he promised he would, he came and Jesus will come again. So what do we do in the meantime while we're waiting again? We find ourselves in a similar situation to those people in Zechariah's day who are waiting for that coming one. We are waiting for the return of the king. Well, we, just like Zechariah, the people in Zechariah's day, get on with the work of building his kingdom, building his temple, which we read is the church. We've been given all the resources we need. We have the word of God. We have the gospel. We have the spirit. And just as Zechariah proclaimed the word that saw the temple built, we also are called to proclaim that same Messiah, to build the church, which is God's people.
May God encourage us and strengthen us in this work. May we work mightily with the power that he supplies so that all praise would resound to him. Amen.